So good afternoon, or good, what time is it? It's still morning. Good morning, oh it's afternoon. Good morning, I can't tell if you're here. Oh good, so um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Carol Mason and I'm the president of John Jay College right now. But the exciting part is that I get to introduce um, someone that I've known for nearly 40 years. Yes, we met in the womb. Um, but uh, she is my best friend, and I've known her since my first days at the University of Michigan Law School back in 1979. And um, she didn't know until right now that I was gonna be the one introducing her. And so she went, uh-oh. Um, but I have nothing but wonderful things to say about her. From the, you will see from this conversation she's about to have with the mayor of Stockton how open and warm she is. So I was 1979 leaving the dining room um, at, the, at the University of Michigan Law School and she was coming in and she just said, hi, what's your name? And started a conversation and who do you know? And of course, when you talk to anybody long enough, you know someone in common and her cousin went to college with me. And that was the beginning of a 40 year friendship. But that's not why she's here today. Um, she's here because of the wonderful things that she's accomplished and the wonderful things that she's done in her own right. Um, but one of the things that, that um, propelled her life to the national stage is that she mentored the woman who became the first lady of the United States and became best friends with the first couple of the United States. Um, now, I know that this is a nonpartisan event, but those of you who know me know that President Obama um, is near and dear to my heart. I spent eight years in that administration working with Valerie Jarrett when she was the senior advisor to the president. And she oversaw the White House Office on Public Engagement and Intergovernmental Affairs. And she chaired the White House Council on Women and Girls. She developed a program called It's On Us, aimed at ending sexual assault on college campuses. She worked on closing the pay gap because women still earn 80 cents to the dollar uh, from what men make, and that's even worse for women of color. And she advised the president on issues such as gun control, criminal justice reform, and immigration reform. And I have to tell you that she's a fierce advocate for reform. We had a weekly Sunday brunch, and I remember a very tough discussion about why we weren't doing certain things at the Department of Justice. And I had the benefit of having the money, the, the $4 billion that went to state and local governments to deal with criminal justice reform. And she challenged me on a regular basis on what was I doing to support reform? What was I doing to support our state and local governments who were there to make lives better for, for our citizens? So she is going to have a conversation today with somebody that she's known for a long time and that she mentored as well. So there's a, there's a tr trend you'll see. Um, and they'll tell you the story, but if you have the opportunity to be mentored by her or to be a friend of hers, take it. So um, she met the now Mayor Tubbs, who's the mayor of the city of Stockton, when he was in college at Stanford. Um, Michael took office in January 2017, and he was the city's first African-American mayor and the country's youngest mayor of a city of over 100,000 people. He's initiated some very successful programs in Stockton, leading to more students entering and graduating from college, a reduction in gun violence, and an enhanced social safety network for the city's most vulnerable people. So please join me in welcoming Valerie Jarrett and Mayor, the mayor of Stockton, Mayor Tubbs, for a conversation. <laughs> Well, hello, everybody. How are you guys doing? Carol, I should say President Carol Mason. I appreciate that wonderful introduction, and I don't know why you had to tell everybody we've known each other almost 40 years. I've been making things up for a while, and she just outed us both. But it's been, in all seriousness, a joy of my life to be friends with her, and I'm so proud that she has an opportunity to lead this incredible institution and convening once again uh, this, this conference. So, uh, Mr. Tubbs, I love saying Mr. Tubbs because I knew him back when he was not Mr. Tubbs. <laughs> uh, I'm delighted to have you here. Not long ago, we had a chance to sit on a stage together and the, sh the table was turned. He was interviewing me. And so now I am delighted to be holding onto the mic and getting to ask the questions. Uh, and I didn't tell him what any of them were ahead of time. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be fun. But I'll start with a softball. So. Uh, I always think it's helpful to appreciate 
vision and leadership, when we understand concept and uh, what your life was like up until the time we met. Uh, well, again, thank you so much. It is very ironic that the tables have turned. I was just getting coffee, um, not even for her, but for people under her, um, eight, eight years ago. So it's, it's definitely a surreal moment. And thank you, John Jay, for having us. And thank you for the work you all do. Um, I know in Stockton, a lot of people I'm most grateful for are the folks every day who are doing the Vines interruption work and pushing us to think about how to make our justice system actually, actually just. Um, but in terms of me born and raised in Stockton and a lot of issues around criminal justice reform are things that are very personal for me. And I think that's where the passion comes from. Um, so my father's been incarcerated for the last 25 years. Um, he's still incarcerated to this day. Um, and I decided to run for local office because one of my cousins was a victim of a homicide in Stockton while I was interning um, in the White House. And, and, I, and I used to be really ashamed of that. Um, but I realized, especially in the work we're doing now in Stockton and talking to folks who are victims and perpetrators of violent crime and understanding that the ecosystem of our lives are so similar that these outcomes should be surprising. Uh, when you, my mother, she had me at 17 years old, so she was teen, so we grew up in intense poverty. Um, in neighborhoods that I would argue were structured for violence, neighborhoods with failing schools, neighborhoods with more liquor stores than grocery stores, neighborhoods with more check cashing place in banks, neighborhoods where, where folks were working harder and harder only to fall further and further behind. Um, so all the work we're doing in Stockton is really motivated by not just things I read at Stanford, but, 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 but things I lived. And I would argue that lived experience isn't everything, but I think it's very helpful to add nuance. So when we're talking about numbers and statistics and percentages, for me, they're not just numbers. They're, they're, they're people, they're cousins, they're fathers, they're, they're people um, who have made me who I am today. All right, so let me stop you there, because uh, I think all too often when people talk about the criminal justice system, they do focus on the data, but they also talk about usually the person incarcerated, and they forget that there's a whole family that surrounds that person. So could you talk a little bit more about what it was like to have a father incarcerated and when you were in school, and, and what, it was, what the pressures were that that put on your mom and your entire family? I would say at first, growing up, it was a cause of a lot of like shame. Um, I think especially we have this idea that everyone who's currently locked in a cage in our country are, are there because they're bad people. I um, mean, I'm sure some are, but I'm, I'm not sure everyone is. I'm, I'm, people make bad choices, but there's also a policy choices that help influence the bad choices individuals make. So growing up, I used to be ter terribly ashamed of that, so I would lie all the time. Um, they're like, what does your dad do? I would say things like, oh, I don't know, I don't know him. Or I'd say things, oh, he's no longer here. Or if I was feeling extra snarky, How I would- How old were you when he was first incarcerated? Well, literally, when I was born, he was in the juvenile detention facility. Um, and he was out for maybe a year or two when I was two and three, and then back in, and then out for a little bit and back in, and it was the three strikes, where's the law in the time in California, so then he got 25 for life. Um, but it, when I feel especially snarky, I would say things like, oh, he makes license plates, and no one knew, uh, right? But no one knew what that meant. Um, and it was a cause, I think, of a lot of anger as well, just feeling that something was wrong and watching my mom struggle and her stress and her anxiety um, and working incredibly hard to try to provide for two. Um, but I think it was also a real source of strength. It gave me a real chip on my shoulder because I would hear all these, I remember all these statistics about like kids whose parents are incarcerated are more likely to be incarcerated themselves. And I really internalized that and took that as a challenge. And I think that's why through high school I was super focused. But then when I got to college, I realized that, wow, that, that there's a whole, I remember going to a convening of the Children's Defense Fund about the cradle to prison pipeline during my freshman year in, in college. And I was like, wow, there's a reason why not just my father, but so many kids from my neighborhood, so many of my friends were caught up in the system. And the reason can't solely be because they're bad people who make bad choices and didn't work hard enough. And that just became a passion point for me to really think about if policy could be used in a way that kind of takes people away from families or, 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 or doesn't really help re rehabilitate people, then maybe there's a way for policy to actually help engender good outcomes. And that's kind of why I do the work I do now. So the mayor and I went to the same college. I went there because my freshman year of high school, a very, very handsome man came into our law, my library at my high school and the librarian introduced me to him and he said, I'm at Stanford. And so I decided I was going to Stanford because he was, he was really cute. And I'm telling you, no one could tell me anything else. I'd never visited the campus. I didn't know much about it other than that one really cute guy who was probably long since gone by the time I got there. So what, what motivated you to decide that you wanted to go to st st 
Stanford. I still was not a really cute girl. But what, what, and, and how did you do it? Did you have teachers who took an interest in you? What happened in your life besides your very young mother that propelled you to go to such a great school? Yeah, well, actually, I didn't want to go to Stanford. Um, I think, uh oh, how come? <laughs> well, I think. Interview over. <laughs> <laughs> but growing up in, in, in Stockton, the narrative was to be successful meant you had to leave and get as far away from Stockton as possible. Um, so my mom would indoctrinate me from the time I was seven. She would say things like, you could be anything you want to be in the world. And I believe that. And then she also said, you have to get away from Stockton. You have to leave. There is nothing here. To be successful means you leave. Um, so I really internalized that. So when I was applying for colleges, I went to go all the way on the East Coast. So I applied to like mostly East Coast schools. And then my last application was to Stanford. And there was this question about intellectual vitality. I didn't know what that was. So I said, Mom, I ain't going here. They, they talk, asking questions. What, I don't want to go to a school that wants me to, what, what does that even mean? And she was like, just do it. It's your last application. It's a free application. Um, and then ended up getting in and realizing that being two hours away from home wasn't too bad. And, and also being a 17-year-old, I thought Stanford was like a medical school. So I was like, I'm not going to med school. I want to be a lawyer or, or, or something. Um, and then actually visiting, I'm like, oh, no, it's not. There's people do all type of things here, and the weather's nice, and it's not too far from home. Um, so that's kind of how I decided. In terms of how I got there, very blessed with great mentors. There is one woman in particular. Her name was Carolyn Lawrence, and she was a private college admissions consultant. So she would charge tens of thousands of dollars to help kids apply um, to the top schools. And I met her online. Um, and not a sketchy form in like a college, a college. Co it's getting back to my story, how I got there. <laughs> uh, a website called College Confidential. And I just sent her a message like, hey, I'm this year, I'll be the first in my family to go to college. My mom makes less than 40K. These are my grades. Can you help me? And she took, she just took me on as one of her clients. So she helped me build a college list. She taught me like simple things like, don't apply to college with an email that says love to b-ball. And I was like, why not? Like, I, I love basketball. Like, why would I not put that on my application? That's me. She's like, trust me, first dot last at gmail. It, like, little things like that. But it's funny, but if she had not told me that, cause I was doing this all by myself, I would have sent many emails with love to b-ball at aol.com. Um, so I was lucky in that way. And I was also lucky that my mom my and my grandmother, although they're not highly educated, they really stretched education. Like, being, like bringing a bee home was like a crisis in the family. Um, I would, anytime I got in trouble in class, I would like call them and they would take off work somehow or not, and just be there sitting in the classroom and figure out what happened and yell at me and the teacher. Like we're both, we both have to figure this out. Um, so, so from a very early age, I felt protected and knew that um, school was one path to a better life for me and myself and my family. So uh, the mayor and I met at Stanford when um, I was asked to give a lecture called the St. Clair Drake Lecture. And Professor St. Clair Drake was my favorite professor uh, when I was at Stanford. And so I was, it was an easy hook to get me to go back. And he had passed away years earlier. And so I was honored to do it. So at the end of my lecture, then Michael comes up to me, like right up on the stage. And he said uh, something to the effect of, I really would like to have an internship on the Hill, can you help me? And I said, why would you want to work on the Hill? Why wouldn't you want to work in the White House? And so he said, that never occurred to me. Uh, so he applied, he met my chief of staff who was right there on the spot and he applied and he got in on the merits. But what made you come up to me like that? Because only like one other person did it. Most people at the end of a lecture, they go away. You did not, you must have had intention. What was going through your mind? Well, I was, and why did you think you wanted to work on the Hill? No, I, no. <laughs> so I was 19, and I was straight out of South Stockton, so I'm still figuring out the Stanford thing. And I don't know, you just remind me a lot of the women in my life who were, like, super helpful. So I said, this is President Obama's mentor, so there's nothing I can say that's impressive, but I can at least say hi. And, 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 and <laughs> um, so, so actually I went up, and I was worse than asking for an internship. The first thing I said was, I'll be in D.C. in the fall. Can we get a cup of coffee? Like oh, we're, you did. Like we're I repressed that because that was crazy. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and then you smiled and you said, uh, <laughs> and then I said, and you're like, what will you be doing there? And I really wanted to do a domestic, I wanted to do policy work. So I said, I'm going to work for the, and by the way, I didn't even apply for the Stanford and Washington program yet. I was speaking into existence. The application wasn't even due, but I knew I was going to be in D.C. So I said, oh, yeah, I'm going to work at the Department of Education. And you're like, why don't you work in the White House? And then I was like, 
I want to do education policy. And then you say, go talk to my chief of staff. <laughs> Um, so thank you for, for your wisdom and your foresight. Because I thought it was a hill. I'm glad to know at least it was the Department of Education. <laughs> yeah. I knew it was something other than the White House. So, all right, so you came to the White House. You blew it away. Everybody in your program and around the building was so impressed with you. Tell us, after you finished school, what did you think about doing? And did you always know you wanted to go back to Stockton? Or particularly since your mom had told you, get out of Stockton, what, what changed that reversed that course for you? Well, I think it was the, just the timing, honestly. So being there in fall 2010, it was right when the Tea Party had taken back the house. So a lot of the idealism was tempered by this, like, Washington gridlock and stalemate. And I remember being there every day and seeing just how hard everyone was working and still just trying to push things, but it was, it was hard. It was, but then at the same time, I was on the intergovernmental affairs team um, working with the mayors and councils. So every day I would come in and do a memo or sit in on the meeting and take notes of a mayor or council member who were doing things for their cities. And I remember thinking at the time, like, wow, maybe the locus of change in this country is not just national or mostly national, that maybe it's at the local level. Um, that you can really move things for 100, 200, 300,000, 400,000 people. So then I said, you know what, my family is still in Stockton, so I want to make sure I use my experiences, kind of my network to really support good candidates in Stockton so they have the same level of gover governance that I'm seeing in other cities. Because at that time, like, Senator Booker was mayor of Newark, Secretary Castro was mayor of San Antonio. There was, like, all these mayors. Mayor Nutter was mayor of Philadelphia, like, all these mayors that with some gravitas were like pushing things forward. And I was like, wow, really impressive. And then while having that internal conversation, that's when my, my cousin was murdered at a house party on Halloween. And I think for me, it was going back home and having to actually deal with raw emotions, pain and anger and figure out- How old was your cousin? He was, I was 20, I was 20, so he was 21. Um, and to just deal, deal with the pain, the emotions and, and then understand that it was one thing to be successful, but I was like, how are the folks that I grew up with, how are they benefiting from the success? That there had to be a deeper reason around sort of why things had gotten so well for me, other than just me making a lot of money. Um, so then I went back home um, after, for a break during my senior year and had to have a conversation with my mom and she was not having it. She was like, what do you mean? And I was like, I told I'm, you not to come back yeah, here. And you do what? Reference to the account? No. And I was like, Mom, like, I really feel like I have to do it. And if I lose, I'll have a great interview answer. So like, let's just do it. I still have my degrees. I can, jobs aren't going anywhere. I can still get a job, but I have to do this. Um, and I think for me, it's been incredibly rewarding because the work's not easy, but just to be able to even change the conversation we're having in Stockton so it's not that folks are bad people, but there's bad, unjust systems. And we can't control individual actions, but we can control the way our, all our systems work and how we work together with the goal of actually helping people. Or even the conversation we're having about victims and perpetrators of crime, often being, at least violent crime, often being one in the same. And also just a conversation around investments. Like, where do you want to spend our precious taxpayer dollars, and how do we make sure we get the best bang for our buck? So again, I'm just incredibly thankful for the, the, the tough decision around, because I think it's easy to sit in anger. Like being angry and frustrated, that's actually easy. Like that takes no effort. But really figuring out a way to channel that anger in a w was very therapeutic for me. And that was kind of my way of, of dealing with the grief, I think. And now understanding that not just in Stockton, but seas across this nation, there's so many families, so many cousins, sisters, brothers, mothers, sons who have to deal with that. Um, it, it, it makes it even much more special, that much more sacred. All right, one more thing about your bio. So you're sitting on the city council. How many are on the city council in Stockton? Six. And you come in as the junior member of the city council, and then you decide to run for mayor. What were you thinking? <laughs> Sorry, my mom. So, because um, <laughs> when I told her I was running for- I am the mom, that's so, what we say. When I told her I was running for mayor, she said, why? You spent four years, you did good things, you paid your debt, like you're good, like go. Go. I was like, Mom, I got to do this. So now she's excited because you only get two terms as mayor. So she's like, at the most, you're going to be here for 2024. Then you have to find something else to do. So she's like, <laughs> count, she has a countdown. She's so, this, I think this will be the first campaign kickoff. She's excited for it. It's the last one. Anyway. Is it the last one or are you going to look for another uh, office? It will, it will have to be the last one locally. And I then, know. That's not what I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I think. I think right? It, <laughs> Don't you think? 
Your, your public service is not over, my friend. I, I, I think if there's another office that makes sense or even supporting someone else in the office, um, I'll, I'll be happy to deeply consider it. Um, what was the question? <laughs> You answered it. It was how did you get to be mayor? All oh, right. oh, oh, I'll tell you the story. It's a good uh, story. Tell a story then. So I spent four years on city council and during that time worked with the police chief to create our office of violence prevention and work on our violence reduction strategy, open up health clinics, shut down liquor stores, a lot, of, a lot of work and it was all centered in my district, South Stockton. So about halfway through the term, people would start coming to council meetings and just yell at me for only caring about South Stockton. So for like six months, I was just upset. Like I was like, why am I being penalized for doing a good job? Like what, council person for South Stockton is doing too much work for South Stockton? Like how is that a bad thing? But people were really hurt. And then I really spent some time and listened and I said what I'm hearing is actually not that I'm doing a bad job, but they're saying the same level of energy and leadership and vision needs to be had throughout the city because it's not just South Stockton that has issues. So that's said maybe I'm supposed to run for mayor. And then people, we're like, are you sure yet? Like maybe one day, but are you sure? And I was like, well, we have four years of a body of work. Um, we have done, we know, the, we know the issues as well as we can. We don't have a lot of age, but we have government experience. We spent four years and a lot of people were worried because in Stockton, especially the narrative around young black men in particular is not one of being like a mayor or a governor. It's one of being like a criminal and being the problem. Being the people we see on the news every day that are messing up our, 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 our great city. Um, in, in 150 plus years, the city had never had a black mayor, and there's like a reason <laughs> for, for that. So a lot of people were worried that at 25, I think is when I announced I would run, that the timing was just a little bit off, and maybe four more years on city council would do the trick. But I said, well, we'll, we'll see. Um, and we worked incredibly hard and, and ran and won, and we've been mayor for 18 months now. Quite a story, right? All right, so let's talk about Stockton and let's talk about your vision. And uh, when, when we were uh, in the White House, the way we envisioned criminal justice reform was, was larger than just those words because what, our goal was to think, what can we do to keep people out of the system to begin with? That's the beginning of it, is to be just and fair and give every young kid a fair chance. What can we do to reform the existing system? And that's everything from bail reform to sentencing reform uh, to uh, diversion programs, et cetera. And then when people are incarcerated, how do we prepare them for reentry uh, and, uh, and ensure that the sentence actually is tailored to the crime and the unique circumstances moving away from these mandatory minimum sentences, which are atrocious. Um, and then when they're released, how do we make a smooth re-entry so that the revolving door doesn't happen? So that's kind of how we always thought of it. And if you look at it that way, it should touch everybody's life to give everyone that fair shot. But you are about reinventing Stockton. So tell us a bit about what that means and how it fits in the context of criminal justice reform as I defined it. Yeah, well, I think it's absolutely spot on. And, and, and for me, Dr. Paul Farmer, he talks about this idea of structural violence and how the way different systems interact make it so that violence is an outcome, that, that it shouldn't be a surprise that we get the outcomes we get given the inputs and the structures we have around them. So really when we talk about reinventing Stockton, we're talking about how do we make sure that all the systems that we've created as citizens in, gov in creating government, how do we make sure all those systems are working in a way that do no harm and actually help, especially the most vulnerable. Um, and the difficulty of doing that as mayor is that in California, the mayor, the only social service I have authority over are cops. Um, and, and for so long, our investment policy, not just in Stockton, but everywhere else, has been, let's make cops the answer to poverty. Let's make them the answer to education. Let's make them the answer to jobs. Let's make them the, the answer to mental health and trauma. It's like, let's just send more officers, more officers, more officers. And what's interesting in Stockton is that our officers are like, doing some of those functions now. And I keep saying, like, I want you to do law enforcement. Like, let's find some social workers to do the social work and some therapists to do the therapists. But I'm glad you, you see the need for that to be part of your toolkit um, as well. So, and then I alluded to it a little bit earlier, but basically when we say reinvent Stockton, we just want to change the conversation for one that's looking at an outcome as if this outcome is peculiar to one that understands that unless we change the way we educate our kids, um, when only 17% of all adults in the city have a BA or higher, 
Um, when 23% of families live in poverty, when the area median income is 46,000, when we've been double the state average for about 30 years on average in shootings and homicides, and when 92% of those have been um, young men in color, when the city's only 11% African American, so maybe 4 or 5% African American males, but they've made up 40% of all homicides and shooting victims in the last 20 years. Like, it's like, it's, we have to change all of that, and it's not going to happen overnight. Um, but it happens with really focused deterrence through our ceasefire program and understanding that in building relationships, there's an opportunity. Tell us, tell us about the ceasefire, because obviously everybody tailors it. What, what's um, unique about yours, or what is it that you think is effective, I guess? Yeah, I, I think what's unique about ours, it's, pro it's probably just a cast of players, because I think the strategy is really the same in that we identify um, the men um, and I think it's also a larger meta conversation about this like kind of cultural violence and toxic masculinity because it's all 92% are men, 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 men. Um, so we sit down with them, myself, police chief, U.S. attorney, pastors, social service providers, and, and the message is, hey, violence is top priority. The violence has to stop. Cops, law enforcement aren't going anywhere, and in fact, they're more focused on this than ever. But on the flip side, what we want to do differently <clears throat> is give you as much attention from the social service world as you get from law enforcement. We know you interact with law enforcement a lot, so how do we get you to interact with our mental health professionals, with our job training programs, and then how do we, and then the flip side is talking to our programs about how do we make sure if they go to job training, they get a job, because you don't think worse than no hope is false hope in terms of um, trying to change, and change is hard, especially if you've been mired in the life, and just because you come to one of our columns doesn't mean you've moved all your friends have changed, or the material circumstances of your life have changed, so it's understanding that what we're asking you to do is hard, and we, have, we understand that it's hard, but, but we're committed to walking with you. So that's our ceasefire program. Well, let me ask you this, because it, it brought to mind another question, which is obviously you need the business community's buy-in, and jobs are in the business community. And so in that context, not just about ceasefire, but more generally, how have you managed to engage your business community so that they feel like they are invested in the solutions and a part of those solutions? Well, what's in, uh, so in January of this year, um, so in, in addition to ceasefire, we're also running the Advanced Peace Program, which is focused on a smaller number of guys, of just the 25 guys identified through community research and and police algorithm statistics that, that we know are currently actively bearing firearms or likely to be shooters or be shot, and giving them intensive seven days a week case management, trial opportunities after six months, stipend, et cetera. And it was a little bit controversial because of the stipend part, but the business community wrote letters of support. And it came from just sitting with them and having a conversation around, look, you guys, we're a city of 320,000 people, and what's hurting your business oftentimes is our image. And our image is rooted in the reality where less than 1% of our population drives 80% of our violent crime rate. So whether you like these guys or not, they impact your bottom line. Because when people are reading articles about the shootings in Stockton and, and the violence in Stockton, they're not talking about me and you. They're not talking about 99.9% .9 of the people. It's how will we let 200 people shape the perception of our whole city? And, and, and what and what do you have any skin in the game? Like the police chief's working overtime, I'm doing my best, but how can you help? And they've been really energized and motivated. And, be and before that, in 2013, after we exited bankruptcy, we went to the business community and the community writ large and say, well, hey, we have to raise taxes um, to really create an office of violence prevention that's focused on preventing and reducing violence. And also to add some more officers, because at one point we had the lowest officers per capita of any city um, um, in the nation, and they stepped up and said yes, and ran the campaign and signed on. So we've been really blessed to have the support of our business community to really think about sort of how do we make it so we actually make reductions, and how is that rooted in evidence, even if it doesn't confirm our own biases or our own assumptions. And I've been really blessed to have a business community that gets that. I think it's because everyone's just tired. Like we've been dealing with this for 30 years. Like clearly, what we were doing in the past hasn't worked as well as we wanted to. So let's try something new. They're hungry for change, too. Um, all right, so I know a little something about change and a little something about hope. But when you finish your last, yeah, it's getting ready to go dark here for a second, though, because when you finish your last term, um, one of the challenges, of course, is that when you turn the gavel over, uh, you want to make sure that what you've done is sustainable. And so, um, obviously, 
it would be um, apparent to anybody that a lot of what President Obama did when he was in office is there have been attempts to unwind it. What strategies are you thinking through now to ensure that whoever succeeds you, it will be harder to reverse? And I think one obvious one is getting buy-in from the business community, because hopefully they'll hold the next person accountable. But what else are you thinking about so that your hard work doesn't get reversed? I think we spend a lot of times engaging the community-based organizations as well as the business community, um, because especially in, in, in local government, pol terms come and go, politicians come and go, but the, the, the community-based organizations, they, they're going to be there. Um, so I've been bringing them along every step of the way and ha 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 having them lead it and not actually seeding some things in them versus in government. So even if the next person is like the next person we have on Pennsylvania Avenue, that, that they have enough capacity to, to, to withstand and resist. And I think the other part is also institutionalizing it as much as possible. And, but speaking about it, so it becomes just part of the lexicon. So it becomes part of just the conversation we have as a community. And I'm I, not sure. And, but also just making sure, I think it's easier to, to, to support um, a successor in, in, in a city that's only 300,000 people. Um, so I'm, I'm fairly confident that we'll make sure that we have all the folks in line to support folks who are gonna continue the, the vision, but also understand the vision is le led by me, but it's really rooted in what the community wants to see for itself in terms of being a community of opportunity, a community of fairness, a community of, of, that embraces diversity and equity and, and a community of second chances. Um, so I guess to answer your question, spending as much time as possible just seeding things in the community, in the community, in the community, and also putting things on the books when, where appropriate. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, you are an inspiration to me. You know that. I've told you that a thousand times. I'm so proud of you when I get to say it because I knew you back, but back when, so it's not intended to um, be anything other than out of love and admiration for everything you've done. In the time we have left, and I, I'm, I'm sorry to see that clock going down because we did want to have some questions from the audience, which we're not going to have time to do, but leadership is an important skill that you clearly have. You've mastered it at a very young age. What advice would you have to the people in the audience who are in their communities trying mightily to bend the arc of the moral universe towards justice and coming up against all kinds of resistance, and whether it's at the federal level, and I'm, I was actually delighted to hear Mark Holden think, say he's optimistic. I'm not, I'm not sure I share that optimism about a, a bill that we would all support getting passed, but, um, but he does have stick to itness, and that's a good quality. But what would you say to the, the folks in the room and those who are watching about leadership and how to, how to get up in the morning when some days it's really hard? Uh, well, Hmm. Well, I think number one, especially as um, a black person, I, I realized that for the past 400 years, folks had to get up in much more dire circumstances. Um, I, I, I think of, uh, I, I think of folks like, it's like I was really seeing, spending time thinking about Harriet Tubman because I was watching Underground with, with my wife. It's a great show if you haven't seen it. So we're watching the Harriet Tubman episode. And I'm like, wow, she, out, she was like the number one most wanted person in this country. She was like Osama bin Laden in, in like 1800s. And she didn't go to school. She was also a woman in black in 1800s America with no Siri, no MapQuest. Like, <laughs> and, and did she find the North? <laughs> And then go back and bring others with her. And I'm like, that's tired. I'm like, uh, so I'm like, okay, if she could do that, exactly. I could get up and go to this council meeting. Or, or um, <laughs> and, and then um, one of my other mentors is Mary Wright Elderman. And we had a conversation after Tamir Rice incident. And I was feeling really down. And she looked at me and she said, do you not understand that it's a, it's a privilege to struggle for justice? And I said, huh? She said, it's a privilege. And she talked about like, how she 50 years, how she started with the sit-ins at Spelman and then started to see, like, head start and bringing um, Attorney General Kennedy to see the poverty. And she talks about how over the past 50 years there have been so many gains and so many losses. But she said, I feel proud to stand in the lineage of folks who have struggled and pushed the ball forward. And then I think the last thing for me is just understanding that 
The only thing that's guaranteed is that if we don't do nothing, nothing changes. And there's no guarantee that everything we do will work. Um, that's for sure. But, but, but the only guarantee is if we do nothing, nothing changes. And I think for me now, I have a little bit of degrees. Uh, I, I have a little bit of a platform. Like I'm, I, if, I'm, I, if I quit, I'll be all right. right? Like me and my family will still have our bills taken care of and eat. But there's so many people I represent who a choice of apathy or a choice of nihilism is like a choice of like, de- like to, or fatalism is like a choice of almost death, or at least economic death. And for me, it's like, well, if these folks can get up every day and pick fruits for everyone and drive Uber and Lyft and DoorDash and still raise kids, and again, I could get up and go to this council meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Tubbs.